just let the just let everyone entering the room um, before starting. So within just a few minutes. Um, first of all, for information, this webinar will be fully in English. Uh, no translation today in French for those who may need it. However, we will share with you the relevant information regarding the report and all the content that you can find online, both French and English. And our team will also be available to um, share with you uh, the relevant data and information in the chat box if needed. Feel free to ask any question in the chat box during the webinar. Uh, a small time, 5, 10, 15 minutes maybe if we are quick enough. Uh, will be dedicated for questions and exchange. So feel free to, to ask uh, where whatever you need. Um, and um, yeah, I think I think that's it. Uh, just for you to know, also this session will be registered, so you can find a replay online after that. Um, good morning. Uh, good morning for those who are in the morning, because here in France. I'm Antoine Gillot. I work as the director of the Global Observatory of um, Climate Action for Climate Change Association. And along with my colleague Tania here uh, by my side and uh, Quentin Pchini from Enadata, we are about to introduce you to the Global Synthesis Report on Climate Action. I was just released um, yesterday or Monday um, in French. That will soon be released in English with an uh, a few days just right before COP28. Altogether this afternoon, we will uh, introduce you the key findings of the report. And first of all, I would like our president and founder, uh, President Senator Roman Dantec, to say a few words. Thank you, uh, Antoine. Uh, I am very happy to introduce uh, as this meeting, this presentation of uh, the principal conclusions of uh, our annual report. Uh, maybe first point, thank you for the team of climate change, the team of the observatory, Antoine, Tanya, uh, Melen, because it's a very small team for a big report. And uh, uh, it's a hard work to, to uh, uh, publish uh, this report uh, every, uh, every year. This year is a specific uh, year because, as you know, uh, the COP is the COP of the global stock take. It is the COP who analyze the reality of actions after uh, Paris uh, Agreement. And um, the specificity of the, of the report of climate change is to try to analyze the reality of action of non-state actors reality of action of enterprise company, reality of action of local government, reality of action and mobilization of civil uh, society. And of course, we, we cross uh, this action of non-state actor with the, the framework of the different uh, state. Uh, Antoine uh, will present to you uh, the conclusion of the, of the report, but uh, maybe uh, just a few, few words. Uh, uh, about the, the conclusion of the situation uh, today. Uh, this, report, uh, this report is very lucid about the situation. We know that uh, the, the emissions are uh, very important, uh, 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 never so important than uh, this, uh, this year. Uh, we know that it will be very difficult to stabilize climate uh, under 1.5 uh, degrees. Uh, it's not a very optimistic report at this moment, but uh, it is a reality of situation. But maybe some few factors for, for, for the hope. Uh, first, it's a, a real dynamic of the development of uh, renewable energy. Uh, today, uh, renewable energy capped uh, a majority of investment in energy in the world. It's very important. It's not enough. Clearly, it's not enough. And maybe it will be a, a point for the discussion during the COP in Dubai, how mobilize more money uh, for uh, to to uh, uh, have uh, a development uh, faster of uh, renewable energy. It's a very important point. Uh, we we see that electrification is in progress in some sectors, as of course 
uh, uh, mobility. And uh, we see with the example of uh, electricity in, uh, in, uh, in transport that when we have the mobilization of the company, the good framework of, of the state, and Europe is a good example, but China too, uh, we, we can have a, a very important uh, change in few years. It's possible. And we have this example with electricity in mobility. After, of course, it, it is a very important for this report. We, we see that the mobilization, the dynamic of local government uh, continue. We Maybe uh, we have a, a little bit of a lack of data to compare uh, the result of different local government, but we have this mobilization with the different networks. It's important. We see uh, that for some companies, now it's very important to, to present a climate strategy with some difficulties, but Antoine, uh, uh, explain this point uh, during the presentation. And we see that we have uh, the pressure of civil society uh, and with some different action of civil society uh, who focus uh, on uh, on different companies, who focus on legislation, and it's a new mobilization of civil society, new form of actions. Uh, it's just uh, an introduction. Thank you uh, to be present for this presentation. Thank you for the team of climate change and Antoine, I give you the floor. Thank you so much, Ronan, for your word and for taking a, a few time in your very busy agenda uh, to be with us uh, this afternoon. So I'd like first to say that this report was uh, a bit special uh, this year because it was made in partnership with another organization, NR Data, which uh, has worked with climate change uh, for years, providing us with the data that we use to analyze the evolution of emissions and uh, energy production and consumption. So I would like to give the floor to Quentin Chini, project manager at NR Data to provide us uh, as an introduction with few insights regarding um, the evolution of trends that were projected in 2015 and those that were indeed observed in 2022 after eight years of the Paris Agreement. Quentin, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Antoine. Um, I hope you can all hear me well or well enough. Uh, I don't know if you can see me. I activated the webcam, but I mean, it doesn't really matter. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm I'm really happy uh, to be the spokesperson in this occasion of Ener Data. As as you just said, we've been um, we we had uh, we have we've had this partnership for a few years now, and uh, I think we we took it to the next level. Although uh, I would say that our contribution was still was still quite modest. Um, uh, I was happy to 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 be able to be a little bit more involved with what you do and. Um, and uh, on, on top of that, uh, we are also producing our own uh, global stock take assess assessment, which, um, which I think is quite complementary because the, the approach is a little bit different from what climate change is doing. And uh, I'm happy to give you a few insights into that, which will serve as an introduction to, uh, to, um, uh, to Antoine and Tanya's uh, presentation. So yeah, if you can go to the next slide. So uh, basically, I don't know if it's really necessary, but to to say a few words about the global stock take uh, itself. So it's it's a part basically of the Paris Agreement, uh, with the aim of basically assessing the implementation of the uh, collective progress towards uh, the 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 objective of the Paris Agreement. Well, the the general critic that we can make of it is that it's uh I mean it's not about pointing fingers it's 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 really a global perspective there's no really deep assessment of you know at a regional and sectoral level of what really happened and I think this is where uh, we and climate change can really add their own uh, contribution and get maybe a little bit deeper into these um this, these considerations so we wanted to produce our own independent analysis which includes a, a this regional and sectoral breakdown the idea for us was to identify the main drivers behind what really happened uh, in terms of emissions since 2015 with a focus on energy because we're, I mean, we are energy data and uh, this is basically um, our main uh, uh, domain of expertise. And also to put, you know, this past evolution um, in, in, in the perspective of our uh, long-term perspective work, namely the end of future scenarios. I mean, I won't say too much about these scenarios, but there will be a few instances where I will be comparing basically what happened uh, compared to what should happen um, uh, according to our scenarios. 
Um, so I will not be uh, getting into much detail today in terms of sector because I will leave that to Antoine and, and Tanya. So I will give more of a general overview of what happened uh, from, a, from a macro perspective. And this would be using partly uh, the Kaya identity. If you're not familiar with the Kaya identity, it's a very simple yet quite reliable way of basically identifying main drivers behind the evolution of emissions, uh, CO2 emissions. It's the equation that you can see here. So basically emissions equal population. So the idea of you know the demographic pressure, if population increases, all of the things being equal, emissions, energy consumptions, and, and emissions will, will increase. GDP per capita as an indicator of you know, economic growth, uh, the increase in uh, standards of living, energy intensity, so the amount of energy consumed um, on, on, for, for a unit of, of, of GDP, and the common factor, which is basically the common content of, of energy consumption. So again, I will be staying at a very general level, but we uh, are producing a complete assessment, and yeah, sorry for the, for the cross-promotion, but we are also uh, having a webinar next week where we'll be presenting basically the the, um, the entirety of, of what we've done in this regard. Um, so let's get into it. First, um, we wanted to basically look back. I mean, I guess it's a mixture of looking back at what we expected in 2015, but also what we now know should have happened since 2015 um, in terms of uh, the evolution of, of emissions. So first of all, it was pretty clear that there was going to be an increase in activity. So because of you know demographic, economic uh, development, as I said, the increase in, in, in living standards, especially in emerging economies. So this would drive uh, the energy consumption um, uh, and, and would lead, again, all of the things being equal uh, to an increase in energy consumption. At the time, we thought that um, this would be at least partly compensated by energy efficiency gains. and. I actually use the term energy efficiency on purpose because there was not a lot of talk about, for example, energy sufficiency. We were mostly considering, um, you know, technological improvements, technical progress, which would help us uh, reducing energy efficiency. In terms of decarb decarbonization, even though uh, the scenarios at the time were a bit more conservative than what we have now, uh, there was still the idea that renewable energies will, will be taking a, a higher share of the total and therefore help decarbonizing the energy supply. On top of you know fossil fuel switching, so switching uh, between fossil fuels, so namely uh, coal, uh, uh, which would be replaced by natural gas, which would help bring down the uh, emission factor as a whole. Um, the idea, and this is our perspective, right, is that you have this uh, chart on the right, which is basically uh, related to uh, the Kaya uh, identity that I presented earlier, where you see the impact on emissions starting from the emissions in 2015 up to the emissions in 2022, and you have the impact of the different drivers that we identify. So basically, the, the population obviously increases. This has an impact on emission, but mostly the economic growth uh, would have the biggest impact on emissions. But our perspective is that if we were to have already implemented efforts that are in line with a pathway that is compatible with the Paris Agreement, we should have been able to compensate for this increase and have you know, emissions that are similar to what we had in 2015. So basically, either already having the emissions already peaked uh, or at least you know, reaching some sort of plateau you know, around 2022. So now let's look at what actually happened and uh, plot twist uh, emissions uh, kept increasing um, and this is despite the fact that the economic growth as you all know we've been through uh, a few uh, crises uh, covid and and and, and uh, other things as well uh, so the economic growth was lower than expected and if you compare if you look at the chart on the right you can see that now what actually happened in terms of drivers actually the pressure for from from uh, the, the the economic growth was much lower than what we expected in 2015. And yet we weren't able to compensate for that um, for that relatively lower uh, economic pressure on, on the energy consumption and emissions. And we still had an increase in emissions. So energy consumption increased by 10% since 2015, with you know, energy intensity barely decreasing. And what's even more um, obvious is how the carbon factor barely really decreased uh, during that period. Despite, and Ona mentioned some of them, despite some positive dynamics, so we've seen that there were, you know, massive investment in renewables, 
Electrification also has gained some momentum. Um, so you have the example of EVs, which is a very positive sign, but it's also a very limited sign. And uh, I mean, ultimately, it only helped uh, reducing the the, the 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 share of oil products in the transport sector only in the transport sector by one percent. So the impact was quite limited. Fossil fuel consumption has actually grown in absolute terms, and its share in the total energy consumption is still, you know, remotely the same. So we went from 82% to 80% uh, in 2022, and therefore CO2 emissions uh, continue to increase by 7% between 2015 and 2022. So what do we do now? Um, and just to give you an idea of um, what we should do in terms of uh, the, you know, the chart on, on the right, which is basically what happened historically, what would happen if we keep the same trend in terms of you know, uh, improving energy intensity and carbon factor, basically the same way um, as, as we did between 2015 and 2022, uh, we would have the, the gray dotted line essentially. And what we need to do to limit temperatures, so we say below two degrees Celsius, 1.5 between 1.5 and, and 2 degree we try to be a bit more conservative in terms of you know how we think our scenarios will actually impact um, uh, temperatures but it's basically yeah below 2 degree scenario and you can see that the 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 yeah the effort is quite um would have to be quite significant and and very early on right we would need a few covids uh between now and 2025 if we were to catch up with the trajectory that that we need to to catch up with so it's quite a pessimistic view, but I'll try to still highlight a few, you know, well, we call that opportunities and challenges. I don't know if um, if that's the, the right term, but basically we've seen a lot of ambitious long-term objectives being uh, announced by uh, different countries or even different, uh, actually, uh, non-state actors, which is a positive sign. Now we need to follow up with concrete action plans and most importantly with short-term uh, uh, concrete objectives to accompany these uh, these plans. This is obvious. We need to ramp up uh, the deployment of low carbon technologies, whether it's electrification uh, in, in, in final demand, decarbonization of, of the power sector, bioenergy, um, hydrogen. But in the meantime, and this is really what's worrying, is that we haven't seen much on the demand side, right? And we really need to see actual concrete actions to reduce consumption whether it is for energy consumption or resources altogether. And I think this goes through not just efficiency, but also uh, sufficiency measures and circularity, for example, which uh, honestly are not like we, the, the signs are very, there, there's been some discussion, um, but it's really mostly in developed economies, mostly in Europe. And, um, and uh, this needs to gain uh, a lot of momentum uh, if we are to you know, catch up with the uh, the pathway that would, you know, uh, that would not have such uh, dire consequences on the climate. Um, a few other elements that I think are, you know, things to keep in mind. Um, now that the physical consequences of climate change are more tangible, I don't know what we do with that. We can hope that maybe there, there's going to be a so social and societal pressure that is going to rise and 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 possibly um, possibly help uh, accomplish what we need to accomplish. We also note a growing implication of non-state actors, which is the fact that we have a lot of different initiatives from uh, different boards um, altogether leaves us to think that there could be some sort of snowball effect that would also help us achieving um, uh, our goals. So I will leave it at that and uh, give back the floor to Antoine. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Quentin, for this very insightful presentation. This really helps to um, see what is the gap between what we were expecting in 2015 when the Paris Agreement was signed and what we actually observed uh, uh, ever since since uh, 2015. So um, this uh, is exactly the dynamic uh, the climate change global observatory is in. Uh, we've been working for six years to provide policymakers with the qualitative and quantitative data that help them understand what are the real trends of action that are being implemented on field by non-state actors, including companies, local governments, NGOs, civil society movements, which helps deliver, deliver uh, a reduction in uh, GHG emissions, adapting to climate change and contributing, uh, 
adapting to climate change yeah, and contributing to um, the uh, global development uh, goals. So over the six years, we uh, released 15 reports, including 130 case studies uh, about climate policies implemented in 45 countries, 86 cities and regions, and uh, building on the contributions of more than 150 uh, experts, consultants, academics uh, that wrote in those reports and uh, coming from more than 70 uh, organizations. So this year is quite a special uh, report, as we say, because instead of looking at one year back, we are trying to figure out what are the trends uh, that can be uh, observed uh, from 2015 to 2022 uh, regarding six sectors of emissions, uh, which are six chapters of uh, the report, energy production, transport, buildings, industry, waste, land use, and, comp uh, and land use. Um, there is also uh, three chapters regarding actors, uh, companies, local governments, and civil society. And one last chapter uh, 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 describing and analyzing the movements of global emissions uh, at uh, economic and, and geographical and sectoral level uh, throughout the years. There is one key takeaway per sector in the key takeaways, the, the, the summary of the report that you can find online to, to uh, catch the, uh, the main figures and, and uh, uh, conclusions of the, the report and our analysis. So right now I'm trying to introduce you um, those takeaways in quite a transversal way, but also trying to get into uh, uh, sectorial movements. So let's first take a look at the record in global emissions that were reached over the years since the Paris Agreement was signed. This is the starting point and the bottom line of the analysis. We emitted in 2022 38.2 uh, gigaton of CO2. This is the record. We never emitted as much as in 2022, which means that at global level, at the systemic level, we are very, very far away from our goals to uh, turn down the, uh, the, the curve of emissions and, and reduce it substantially as Quentin uh, uh, underlined it to, to reach the 1.5 and 2 degrees uh, perspective. This is equal to a plus 7.2% in annual CO2 emissions since the Paris Agreement. And I do not take account here of other gases uh, uh, such as methane or uh, uh, nitrous dioxide that are also contributing a lot to short-term and long-term uh, climate change. 88% of the CO2 emissions are coming from the combustion of fossil fuels, which means that this is where we need to take a look at when trying to understand how to act to reduce uh, the uh, emissions of CO2. The problem is that never before has the world consumed so much fossil energy between 2015 and 2022. This is as true for oil, as for gas, as for coal. Uh, the consumption, despite drops uh, during the COVID pandemic, has kept rising uh, uh, as the demand for energy was still uh, uh, increasing at the same time despite uh, uh, substantial investments in different efficiency uh, uh, solutions that are promoted uh, in, in all sectors. So now, after that very gloomy description of the global situation, our job is to try to take a deeper look uh, into the positive and negative trends that we can observe at uh, uh, national and sectoral level. The first thing to understand is 84% of global emissions are from the G20 countries, which uh, is quite steady over the years. It was the same ratio, more or less, in, in the two, uh, uh, in 2000, for instance. Um, this is an important data because it means that nearly 20 governments uh, have the power to cut 84% of global emissions. So politically speaking, this is very, very meaningful, especially when we uh, uh, understand that China was home of 70% of the growth in emissions since uh, uh, 2000. It means that China is not only responsible for the growth in emissions because it is obviously producing for the rest of the world, but it also means that the Chinese government has a great, great power 
uh, an importance to to curb emissions uh, in the in the in the way we need to to reach our goals. If we take a look at the economic level, uh, we also see that there are, there is a, a gap now between uh, industrialized countries and emerging countries. In the OECD, we observed a, a decrease of 6.5% in emissions uh, uh, between 2015 and 2022 since the Paris Agreement, while the emissions were, uh, on the contrary, rising by 15% in non-OECD. Uh, uh, countries. This is especially true in major economies such as Indonesia, uh, where we observed substantial uh, uh, increase uh, in emissions uh, because of industrial uh, uh, and uh, coal uh, production. Uh, this is also true in India, but this is uh, all the more very important in, in China, which now represents uh, uh, one third of global uh, emissions for reasons that we analyze uh, in the report. This is for the national perspective, but this should not um, hide another truth. That is, we live in a globalized economy, which means that where when emissions are rising somewhere in the world, it does not mean that this is down to the consumption patterns of the population living in that country. Let's take, for example, uh, European Union that managed to decrease by 25.6% their emissions in 30 years between 1990 and 2022. Um, European Union is now showing some signals of positive trends uh, uh, of transition in some sectors, including a boom in, in, in solar and, and wind produ uh, electricity production, but also the electrification of buildings, transports, including the production of batteries, which are requiring a substantial, uh, substan uh, uh, great amount of minerals. Among these minerals is nickel, and nickel is mostly held by Indonesia in the underground. And also the, the capacity to refine and process uh, uh, nickel is mostly located in Indonesia right now, which means that Indonesia, uh, uh, open a lot of coal-fired uh, 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 utilities to produce electricity to feed uh, the plants needed to process the nickel used to fabric uh, batteries to decarbonize transport in the European Union, but also in China. So it means that at the end of the day, when you see a rise in 25% of emissions in Indonesia, this is as much uh, because of um, the developing trends of the economy in Indonesia and new consumption patterns among the middle class and the uh, upper income classes, um, but also because of the intrication of a globalized economy. The, um, this finding shows that some signals of transition somewhere in the world does not mean that the global system is actually decarbonizing. So this is very, very important to uh, provide some nuances to the national and territorial uh, uh, analysis of global emissions. Now let's take a look at some sectoral trends that we managed to spot uh, over the years in, uh, uh, in different countries. Uh, let's start with the energy production. So if you take a look, you have 48% uh, uh, of global emissions that are uh, due to electricity generation and other sectors of the uh, the energy production. Uh, you have also 23% of industries and construction and 20% of transport at global level. These shares are obviously uh, changing according to the countries, like for example, a country such as France that has a lot of nuclear power, which is quite low carbon. It means that electricity generation is smaller uh, in the global share, uh, in the national share of emissions and uh, uh, transport becomes uh, the, the main sector of emissions of CO2 in this country. So it means that priorities according to countries are also varying. But for our analysis, we took this uh, uh, division of uh, responsibilities in sectorial uh, terms, and we tried to find out what are the positive trends and signals that help to understand the evolution of uh, uh, the global transition. So, 
Let's start by uh, electricity production. Now we know that the average carbon intensity of electricity generation decreased by 8% between 2015 and 2022. This is very positive, although it's obviously not enough. Um, this is mainly due to um, the boom in renewables uh, that is uh, 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 shown uh, on the right hand uh, graph that you can see here regarding new capacity installed every year because of record investment that are now, now outpassing uh, the investment in uh, bypassing the investments uh, in fossil fuels. So you can see with the green bars that now the uh, uh, renewable electricity capacity are far away above uh, fossil fuels installation of new capacities. However, the generation of electricity is still very, very dependent uh, uh, to uh, fossil fuels uh, because the, uh, the amount of new capacity, of new renewables capacity that you need to uh, input uh, into the system is all the more important as uh, uh, the fossil fuel capacity that are a little bit more efficient in terms of ratio of uh, production by capacity. So about 30% of renewables now are uh, providing the global electricity generation compared to 23%. This is quite an improvement, but this is still very, very uh, slow compared to the need we have for the 1.5 um, targets. Um, so yeah, basically, uh, 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 there is a 82 person growth in renewable capacity between 2015 and 2022. And now the global capacity of uh, uh, installed uh, electric production capacity is renewable by 40% at the global um, level. So these are some positive trends and are uh, uh, leading us to be, uh, I'd say, a bit about the capacity to change the, electric the, the, the electricity mix. However, and this is a yes, but transition movement that we are seeing right now, where coal is uh, uh, phased out either uh, uh, completely or uh, progressively, such as we see in the United States, um, we also have to admit that it benefits as much to natural gas or fossil gas as it is uh, to renewables. This is the case in the United Kingdom where coal was still the main source of production of electricity uh, in 2014, and who, uh, in within a, just a few years, managed to phase out coal uh, uh, to such a level that now, in 2023, uh, the United Kingdom uh, uh, can produce electricity without using any coal capacity uh, some months. But this transition that you can also observe in Spain is as much beneficial to uh, gas as it is to uh, uh, wind power or to uh, uh, solar power. And uh, you have to know that in the United States, where you have a decrease in coal by 48%, uh, despite uh, uh, the presidency of Donald Trump, that was still very uh, uh, favorable to, to coal production, 75% uh, um, of the, uh, the closing uh, coal capacity are uh, replaced by gas firing capacity. So um, this is still de halving the amount of CO2 by uh, uh, kilowatts of uh, electricity production, but it is far not enough for uh, a real and deep transition pathway. Let's take a look at the trends per seconds now. The, the logic is quite the same. It's a yes, but transition. You have EVs that are that have boomed and skyrocketed in some markets over the last years, including in the EU and in China. Now about 14% of vehicle sales are electric in 2022 versus 4% in 2020. And the share of electric vehicles in global sales uh, is even reaching 88% in Norway, for instance. So you have some trends of changes that are quite positive and that are leading to a global increase of the global share of EVs in the vehicle sales, yet, um, or still, this trend is also helping uh, the automaking industry to decrease their uh, ratio of average emissions, such as uh, such as the, the European Union is asking to through its regulation. You see also a lot of countries and local jurisdictions that are asking to phase out uh, fossil fuel vehicles from uh, city centers or uh, the sale uh, of international uh, internal combustion vehicles. And this is overall leading to um, a decrease of 
slight decrease uh, of 1.5% of CO2 from the transport in the OECD countries. So there is a hint of transition in the transport sector that is imputable to the electrification of transport, but that is still very, very uh, 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 weak compared to uh, the share of fossil fuels in the global transport system. This is the next slide. Um, the ratio of uh, electricity in the in the global transport energy mix, not only the road transport energy mix, is still very very low. There's only 0.3 percent of electricity that is uh, powering the transport uh, system, uh, with 4.7 biomass that is competing a bit with oil uh, in few countries such as Norway, Sweden, Brazil, or Indonesia. But these are exceptions. Oil is still the very king uh, of uh, the, the transport system. Um, there is also a, a lack of infrastructure to accompany the, this race of uh, electric vehicle sales in countries such as in Europe, where you have uh, 13 EVs for one charging station uh, at the continental level, which is far not enough to encourage people to switch uh, according to the own targets of the Commission. Uh, for a charging station, which is 10 vehicles for one charging station. Um, the other global trends uh, that compensate for a uh, rise in electrification is SUVs. We have now more nearly uh, half of the market that is made of SUVs, which are way heavier, less efficient than the average of vehicles on the market, uh, including for electric vehicles. So 84% of SUVs are uh, international uh, internal uh, combustion engine vehicles. But you have to know that there is also some sort of SUVization of the electric car uh, market with heavier and heavier uh, uh, vehicles that are sold. This is very, very lucrative uh, for the automaking industry. But this is also shifting the dependency from oil to uh, uh, strategic minerals that are asking for a lot of materials and energy to be produced, refined, as we saw in Indonesia, and mean, uh, uh, may in the end lead to a rise in uh, emissions. For other sectors, such as the air transport or the maritime transport sectors, there is no evidence of any switch, despite uh, highly ambitious uh, targets that were set by the international governing bodies. Uh, they are mostly betting on uh, breakthrough in um, in fuels uh, in some sort of electrification, but that cannot be reached yet because of uh, availability of these uh, fuels. Let's take a look now, and I will end with this sector and the forest. Um, to the building sector, the logic is still the same. You have a reduction in energy intensity with a lot of local governments, states uh, that are also having electrification policies phasing out gas in newly built uh, 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 environments. But this is uh, uh, also accompanied by a sale in, in heat pumps, uh, especially in Europe, that is trying to uh, decarbonize the, the building sector. The states are different in emerging and uh, advanced economies. In advanced economies, the built environment needs to be decarbonized through renovation, while in emerging economies, this is mostly on the uh, building the, the coming uh, uh, built environment that has to be uh, fossil uh, uh, free. So the energy intensity is slightly decreasing, but the emissions of the uh, global sector keep rising. That's what we see in the next slide, where 8.5% uh, uh, of the CO2 emissions from the building sector rose by uh, between 2015 and 2022. You have a global raise in the energy consumption of buildings, including electricity, district heat, also renewables, of course, but also gas and oil, which means that the global consumption of energy keeps rising. So we are uh, uh, at global level failing to uh, uh, make a big difference uh, in the building sector. Uh, this is one of the most steady and, and moving uh, uh, sector that we uh, observed, despite some positive signals, including uh, sub uh, substantial raise uh, in the um, uh, certified green buildings, uh, uh, which shows that there are improvements and there are uh, also willingness from some constructor to, to have uh, uh, green buildings where they, they, they try to build new neighborhoods and cities. 
let's take a look now also to what we call the breakthrough uh, uh, and disruptive technologies that can help to make moves in those sectors, including transport, energy, and buildings. Um, this is very important to say a word about that because this will be high in the agenda during COP28 uh, due to the uh, oil producing countries and industries, uh, hydrogen and carbon capture and storage. We took a look and you can find the figures in the report um, to where we are in terms of production of green hydrogen. Bad news, um, there is only 0.1% of low carbon hydrogen produced in the world, so there is still a long way uh, of the decarbonization of the hydrogen production, including also the use and consumption of hydrogen, which is mostly made for a highly carbonized uh, consumption. Uh, uh, consumptions. Uh, regarding the capture and the storage of carbon, which is also uh, evidence as a path transition by the IPCC, uh, we need to note that today the capture capacity in style uh, uh, is equal to Sweden's emissions, i.e. 0.1% of global emissions. If you take all the projects including in the pipeline right now by 2030, this should raise to 0.6%, but this is still far not enough to make uh, a real difference. Although huge investments that are uh, starting to rise again from some states, but also from oil companies that are betting on uh, carbon capture to use the carbon to uh, 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 produce uh, enhanced oil recovery, uh, which means to uh, uh, make their uh, oil wells uh, uh, produce longer and uh, uh, which does not help uh, to uh, uh, store uh, the carbon at long term to make a huge difference in the uh, mitigation. Uh, targets. So uh, finally, I will end with the forest sector, just to say a word. After um, a peak uh, in 2016, and you can see on the right-hand graph of uh, at 30, about 30 million hectares, um, deforestation has decreased uh, and uh, the loss of tree cover uh, is quite substantially decreasing in some countries, including Indonesia, uh, helping, helped by uh, difference uh, by regulation of the oil palm industry, but also uh, new regulations at the European level uh, asking for to uh, impede uh, imported deforestation. This is all putting pressure on the uh, oil palm industry in Indonesia and Malaysia, which has uh, led to a decrease in in in, uh, in deforestation in those countries. While in Brazil or in the uh, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, which are huge carbon wells, uh, the forest uh, is still uh, uh, being deforested at a quite a high uh, pace. Although over the last year, uh, since Lula election, it seems that there are there is some hints of decrease of the deforestation rate uh, in Brazil. Fundings are also rising a lot uh, for biodiversity protection and for uh, nature-based carbon credits uh, on the voluntary carbon markets, which shows a huge interest from the private sector to um, offset their emissions by the purchase through the purchase of carbon credits in helping pro uh, protect the, uh, uh, the, the the forest through uh, uh, nature-based solutions. But there has been some investigation over the methodologies uh, behind those credits that show that there is still a lack of consistency uh, when it comes to defining the, the, the scenarios and make it credible uh, uh, to, to, to decrease the, the rate of deforestation. Uh, in the end, the global sequestration uh, capacity in tropical forests uh, of carbon is uh, decreasing, uh, has decreased over the, over the years. Uh, um, this is still, uh, um, despite the, 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 the slowing of the deforestation, a very high deforestation dynamic that is uh, implemented uh, under our eyes, um, which means that the capacity of the global system to absorb the extra emissions that we're sending into the atmosphere every year is weakening. So um, the signal is is very uh, a yes, but uh, uh, signal, as I said before. I would like now to um, introduce you to my colleague, Tanya Marta Thomas. Um, to provide you some information regarding the actors 
uh, at the company and local government levels uh, from the reports, and then we will be open for questions uh, if you have some. Thanks, Anton. So, um, yeah, now that we have a sort of sectoral overview of what the big trends have been, um, I'd like to quickly just focus on what the roles of the different types of actors that we've looked at have been in um, leading us to these results. So starting off with companies, uh, what we found in our report is that um, <clears throat> There is this um, increasing dynamic, but um, as Antoine said, uh, in the other trends, it comes punctuated with a but. Um, so uh, to, to, to look at climate action of any company um, or uh, to sort of plan uh, their climate action, companies essentially need to take three steps uh, to get started with the process. The first is measuring and then disclosing their emissions. Uh, and then the second is setting uh, credible targets to reduce these emissions. And the third is to set up a transition plan, which would detail the specific uh, steps that they would have to take to uh, achieve each of uh, these targets that I mentioned. So if we look in terms of disclosure and uh, uh, the measurement of emissions, we see uh, on the curve that you see on the screen that there is an increasing trend. Um, 71% companies uh, currently report their scope one and two emissions. Uh, but the catch here is that scope one and two emissions are their operational emissions, the ones that they can directly control. Um, whereas scope three emissions are at a disclosure rate of about 22%. Whereas scope three emissions actually account for about 75% of a company's total carbon footprint. And if we talk about fossil fuel companies, this could be 80% of their emissions. Uh, or if it's a financial institution, this could be as high as 99% of their emission. Um, but yet we see that there's progress. And then um, in the next step, which is that of targets, uh, we see that there's more and more companies, for example, that are trying to get uh, their targets validated by international initiatives like the SBTI, the Science-Based Targets um, Initiative, uh, as being credible, as being aligned with a scenario of uh, reducing emissions to stay within 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees. Uh, and then the, the last step, which is that of making transition plans, seems to be uh, where there is a blockage where uh, companies seem to be struggling the most right now. So um, we, we noticed that in 2022, there were 18,000 and more companies around the world that reported to CDP, which is an international platform, uh, about their transition plans. And what they found out is that uh, only 0.4% of these plans were actually uh, credible. And this again means that only 0.4% of companies were able to provide enough details in CDP's questionnaire about their transition plan. So even if um, they were able to provide all of these, it doesn't entirely translate into a solid transition plan. Um, the ACT methodology, assessing carbon transition or carbon transition um, is an, another methodology that evaluates the credibility of transition plans presented by businesses by comparing them with the International Energy Agency's scenarios for decarbonization uh, by looking at different aspects uh, and sector specific details. And what we found is that uh, the, the average ACT score right now of companies is 26 on 100, which um, is relatively low. Uh, but at the same time, we noticed that companies are under pressure from two different uh, parallel phenomena. So first we have, uh, on the one hand, this sort of growing pressure in terms of regulation, uh, which is coming from more and more international standards or recommendations which are being adopted, uh, starting with uh, the, the recommendations of the TCFD, for example, the Task Force on uh, Climate-Related Financial uh, Disclosure, uh, which are recommendations, so they're voluntary, but there's also more uh, mandatory ones coming up like those imposed by the Securities Exchange Commission uh, or proposed by the Securities Exchange Commission in the US or um, under the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive in Europe and so on. And if you'd like to find out more about this, we have a blog on uh, our website, which is dedicated to this, which you could take a look at. Um, 
The second factor that's sort of adding pressure on companies is civil society uh, through two trends. The first one is shareholder activism. So we see that there's more and more climate related resolutions proposed by shareholders in the general body meetings of uh, companies. And the rates of approval are still relatively low. Um, but what we do notice is that the say on climate resolutions, which are proposed by the company's board themselves, tend to have a higher rate of approval. Uh, and companies also tend to uh, reach an agreement before going into these meetings, uh, which is something that is not necessarily reflected in these figures. Uh, and the final trend that we would like to highlight in this context is that of increasing climate related litigation. So um, we see that there's over 2,300 cases that have been registered since 1986, but a good majority of this was filed after 2015, so after the Paris Agreement. Uh, and these are being increasingly filed against governments, but also against companies for failing in their duty of care uh, among uh, And we see that nine out of 10 of these cases has always been at the initiative of an NGO, and this tends to be more the case in the global north. And then the pie chart that you have on the right shows you um, the uh, results of this litigation uh, that we've been seeing. And so it's quite encouraging to see that more and more of these results have been positive so far. So that is about companies. Uh, and then the next thing is to look at local governments, what is happening at a local scale. So we see that cities and regional governments are setting more and more ambitious uh, targets and they're even uh, overshooting, they're doing even better than the target. Um, but measuring progress remains an obstacle. So. Um, if we take the example of European cities that are signatories uh, to the European Covenant of Mayors, we uh, see, according to a study published by the Joint Research Center of the European Union, um, that in 2020, based on targets that were set for 2020, uh, cities were able to reduce their emissions by over 25%. And uh, this is above the target, uh, the average target when you pool all the city targets together. The average target was a reduction of 22.7%. So this is much higher. But since then, with uh, the scaling up of ambition and uh, with higher and more stringent targets for 2030, the current trajectories show that we are falling a little behind. Uh, and this is something that needs to be um, caught up. Uh, in terms of following the progress that has been made by cities, uh, this year we carried out quite an interesting exercise where we looked at the cities that have been disclosing their emissions to the CDP platform again, uh, where we, we counted a city as having disclosed its emissions if these numbers were not zero and if they were filled in at least once between 2015 and 2022. Uh, and we noticed that there were 862 distinct jurisdictions that reported their emissions and 58% of them reported their emissions at least twice, which allows us to sort of uh, monitor their progress over time between any two given years. Uh, nevertheless, at a global level, aggregating these numbers remains extremely hard because of a large number of methodologies that exist and the switch between methodologies, not just uh, in, in different regions, but also by the same city, which makes monitoring really hard. At the city level, we notice that there's three main um, challenges when it comes to the data. The first is the underreporting of emissions. Uh, so most city inventories are based on statistical inventories, uh, excuse me, um, which make use of emission factors that are adapted to the local context. Um, but the reliability of these inventories is highly variable. So a study on um, 48 of the 100 most emitting cities in the US, for example, showed that they underestimated their fossil fuel emissions by about 18.3%. The second problem that they could have is the boundary issue. So cities account for about 3% of global land mass, but they house more than 50% of the world's population. So this necessarily means that they have to externalize a large amount of um, their emissions outside their administrative borders. Uh, and so, uh, a study of cities that are members of C40, which is a network
network of the big metropolises of the world showed that up to 85% of their emissions take place outside their boundaries, which makes taking these into account in city inventories even harder, um, especially given that local resources might be limited. And uh, this brings me to the last point, which is the time lag, uh, which shows that uh, it, on average, there's about two to three years uh, of gap between when an inventory is prepared and when the city reports its data. Uh, and another study by the JRC that we found showed that there could be up to six years of delay between two inventories uh, of a city. And uh, six years is, is quite a long time. If you think in France, that is the length of a municipal mandate. And so it poses the question of uh, how much more efficient uh, climate action could be if we had updated data. Uh, and so what I would like to finish with is by saying that a lack of data or a lack of monitoring does not necessarily mean that there's a lack of action. So we try to look at the different trends, uh, at the different policy levers that cities have been using to incorporate more and more renewable energy uh, into their uh, consumption. And this is not only in terms of uh, electricity generation and sourcing, but also to other sectors like transport, buildings, everywhere that municipalities have the power to act. So three important tools that or trends that we noticed uh, were power purchase agreements, in, uh, firstly, which is an increasingly popular instrument for the development of renewable energies and um, which accounted for 17% of new renewable capacities in 2022, which were contractualized through PPAs. Um, while these are largely popular among companies mostly, they are more and more popular among cities. In the US, for example, um, uh, cities from 2015 to 2022 more than tripled the amount of uh, clean energy that they uh, source through PPAs. You also have big cities like London or Melbourne that make use of PPAs to integrate more renewables into their mix. The second trend that we noticed was energy cooperatives, uh, which encourage local generation and consumption. So in 2022, the European Commission listed about 900 active energy communities, as they call it, which includes municipal uh, companies, as well as energy cooperatives, which are autonomous groups of citizens that get together to collectively consume um, and or produce renewable energy. So the advantage of cooperatives, <coughs> excuse me, is that they promote democracy, but also tackle um, the, the, the issue of energy poverty. And um, you have studies that show that active local participation in energy matters um, results in a higher percentage of renewables in the mix. Um, while the trend of energy cooperatives was uh, um, mildly destabilized by COVID and the energy crisis that followed in the wake of the war in Ukraine, some of them did show um, the opposite trend where they rendered their communities even more resilient in the face of these crises. The last um, trend that we'd like to highlight here is the municipalization of energy. So I mentioned uh, municipal energy companies before, and um, this is the case in cities like Cadiz or Boulder in Colorado. And then finally, we see that local resistance can either speed up or slow down the transition with um, conflict mm, that could be against or for <laughs> low carbon um, or fossil projects. Mm, thank you, Tanya. Sorry, it sounds like you're a bit sick. I can't take it over. <laughs> no worries. And we're running out of time. So I'd like to invite everyone to ask questions. <laughs> What's very important to wrap up this uh, local government uh, uh, part of the presentation is to understand that at the territorial, the local level, um, there is also sources of conflicts when it comes to transitions between civil society, that is, for instance, uh, 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 competing against decisions for uh, phasing out uh, gas out of buildings in the US or in Germany. And there are also local uh, uh, fighting against infrastructures that are leading to, uh, uh, to conflicts that may win, 
uh, on a climate perspective, but that also sometimes lead to losses such as uh, at the Heathrow Airport in, in, in London that was uh, allowed to uh, expand by the, the Supreme Court. Sorry for being a little bit too long, and I would like to uh, thank our friend Quentin, who had to leave uh, due to other obligations. I would like to invite those of you who may want to stay with us five more minutes um, to ask some questions. If you have some, feel free to raise your hand or to type it down in the chat box. We would be happy to talk with you. You can also open your microphone. There is not too much of us. So this is highly recommended. Et bien sûr, vous pouvez poser vos questions en français si vous souhaitez. You can ask your questions in whatever language suits you. If no question at this stage, then we, I think we can come to an end. And I would like to thank you uh, for being and staying with us until the end of that uh, uh, webinar. Please feel free to take a look at the report, its summary online, and also to ask questions um, by email. Uh, you can reach us to, uh, by, uh, to the email that is uh, now in the chat box, association at climatechange.org. Uh, you can also write to us through social media, um, provide comments on the report. Is it useful for you? Uh, would you like to see some uh, subject to be uh, tackled uh, in this analysis and we will be also happy to meet you at COP28 uh, if you're here. I will be uh, present on site from the 7th to the 12th uh, and other uh, from our team will also join us for uh, a side event to present the report on the 9th of uh, December, a press conference on the 11th and many other events regarding uh, uh, Afri the African community regarding biodiversity and we will be more than happy to welcome you at this moment. Thank you so much. Have a good afternoon and a good morning and a good day and see you soon. Bye-bye.